God. Many stories have been told throughout human history uh, that have been passed down through the centuries, through the millenniums, which have captivated the human heart and the human mind. But there's no story, no story that's ever been told that can compare uh, to the story that we read about in the Bible. Um, the Bible is the best-selling book of all time with, with, with an estimated 5 billion copies sold and distributed worldwide. It's, it's the most read book um, of all of human history because the claims that it makes um, make everything else in life seem minuscule in comparison to those claims. Um, it answers some of life's greatest questions. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Why is the world in the condition that it's in? How do I find purpose and, and meaning in, 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 in my life and, and in the world? And in many such questions, uh, many men have died, in fact, attempting to translate the words of the Bible into a language that uh, can be understood by the general population uh, because they believed that there was no greater message, there was no greater hope, and there was no greater promise that could be found anywhere else within the world. And, and, and at the very heart uh, of this Bible that all of us hold in our hand is a story that transcends time, breaks into our own experience, into this world, and leaves us at a crossroad like no other story has the ability to do. And that's all because that this great story centers on the greatest person that has ever lived, the one and only Jesus Christ. Tonight, we're beginning a new Sunday night series that I'm very excited about, uh, looking at the good news of Jesus Christ according to to Mark. Uh, we're going to be looking at the themes and principles that we find within the gospel of Mark. And tonight we're going to jump right into Mark's gospel account of Jesus and, and look solely at verse 1. Uh, because in verse 1, Mark sets the stage here for the rest of the ideas and themes uh, within the book. Uh, so take out your Bible with me, if you will, and turn to the book of Mark. And let's look at verse one together. I'm going to be coming back to it several times. But verse one states this the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, first of all, here within verse one, we see uh, the, uh, the idea of the beginning. Um, Mark begins his gospel account with the words, the beginning in, in verse 1 here. Uh, now, it's very easy to, 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 to bypass Mark's opening words here and, and miss what he's trying to do uh, un, until we recall the very first passage within Scripture, and that's Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, remember, it says in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God made the heaven and the earth. Now, that might seem kind of odd uh, rendering that I just said, but what, what, what I just read was the English translation of the Septuagint. Uh, the Septuagint is the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament, originally written in Hebrew and, and Aramaic. And, and we see in the Septuagint here that Genesis opens in a very similar way that Mark does. In arche, in, 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 in the beginning. Uh, that's the original Greek. Uh, both Genesis and Mark begin their stories, begin their accounts in a very similar fashion. And I don't believe that's just by accident. Uh, Mark was certainly familiar with the Septuagint uh, when, uh, upon writing uh, this gospel account. So, so, so it would have to be a pretty big coincidence uh, for Mark to open his gospel account of Jesus in, in this way. Uh, I, I believe that Mark is signaling to us a few things uh, by the way that he opens his gospel account using the words, the beginning. Uh, one, of th one thing that he's signaling to us, I believe, is, is this what you are about to read, what you are about 
to dive into here is the beginning of something extraordinary. The, the act of God creating the world uh, was, in fact, the greatest miracle of, of all time. God, God creating everything that we see around us, uh, the, the animals, the plants, the fish in the sea, the birds of, of the heavens, uh, man, man and woman, uh, crowning them with honor and glory and, 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 and dominion and all of the other aspects of, of creation. God, God creating the world out of nothing. That's beyond incredible. It's beyond incredible that God has the power to create what we see around us. The simple words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, should be approached with, with nothing less than awe and absolute reverence and amazement. Uh, the creation of the world, the creation of the cosmos was a truly extraordinary event. And Mark's claim in, in, in the way that he opens his account here by, uh, by, saying, in, uh, by saying the beginning um, is that the story that he's about to t tell, the story that he is about to reveal is on par with, it's parallel with the greatness and majesty of God's act of creating the world. Mark is about to tell you something extraordinary. And he signals that to us by the way he opens the gospel. Another thing that we see uh, within uh, the, the way that he opens here is, is it's a claim to divine origin. M Mark's claiming that what he's about to tell you, what, what, what he's about to proclaim, and what you are about to ingest here is, is from the holy God of the universe. This story is of divine origin. It, it was God's hand that, that created the world, and, and, and likewise, it's the hand, uh, it's His hand that gives this story a divine stamp of approval. This great story we're about to dive into, it, it originates from the God of heaven and earth. It, it's not a man-made story. It's not uh, man-centered. It's not man-created. It's a divinely orchestrated story that God desires every human heart to hear and adhere to. And then finally, another thing that, uh, that, that the opening of the Gospel of Mark reveals to us is that it's the, the declaration of something brand new, of, of a new creation. We see in Genesis chapter 1, we see the very beginning of, 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 of creation. In the beginning was the heavens, God created the heavens and the earth. But now in Mark, we see the beginning of a new creation, some, something new, something, something divine, something out of heaven is about to descend to earth and invade and invade man's space, ushering, ushering in this, this new era uh, that, that's marked by restoration, that's marked by transformation, that's marked by renewal. Uh, it, it's the dawning of a new creation, and that's about to emerge um, in, in, in the world uh, by, um, by Mark's announcement here. A commentator, James Edwards, he says, for Mark... The introduction of Jesus is no less momentous than the creation of the world. For in Jesus, a new creation is at hand. So the way Mark opens his gospel signals to us that something extraordinary is about to unfold. And this story that we're about to see, it's not from, it's not from man. It's from God. And in fact, it's the beginning of something brand new, the beginning of a new creation. Well, likewise, look with me in verse 1, another uh, theme that we're introduced to here that's echoed throughout the gospel. The beginning of the gospel. The beginning of the gospel. In Greek literature, the word gospel or good news is associated with 
a herald's announcement of a, of a coming king, of, of a, sometimes of a conquering king um, that has won victory in battle. Um, it's a royal proclamation of, of, of a king that's coming to bring deliverance, to bring salvation, uh, to bring prosperity, uh, to bring peace uh, to, uh, to a particular people group. Uh, several uh, centuries ago, um, in fact, 9 B.C., about five years before uh, Jesus Christ was even born, um, there was an inscription written, and several years ago it was, it was unearthed, it was found, um, that, that contained very similar terminology that we see within the first verse of Mark. And, and I want, I'd like to read that. Um, it was found in, in um, Asia Minor. Whereas the providence which has ordered the whole of our life, showing concern and zeal, has ordained the most perfect consummation for human life by giving it to Augustus. And that's Augustus Caesar, the Roman emperor. By filling him with virtue for doing the world of a benefactor among men and by sending him, as it were, as a savior for us and those who come after us to make war cease, to create order everywhere. And whereas the birthday of the God, that's Augustus, was the beginning of the world of the glad tidings that have come to men through him. Uh, it's almost reads like an announcement about Christ, doesn't it? <laughs> Something that you would read within the Bible, but it's not. Glad tidings here that we see within this inscription, it, it's, in, uh, it's a form of the word gospel uh, that we see within the first verse of, uh, of the first chapter of, of Mark. Um, the, the Romans said that, that, that glad tidings have come. Uh, glad tidings have, have come to us. To, through our conquering, our, our divine king, he has come and his name is Augustus Caesar. The word gospel here to Mark's original audience was, was, was in fact understood as, as this royal proclamation of, of a coming king who's going to bring peace, who's going to bring prosperity. So when the readers of Mark hear this word gospel, all of these things uh, that, that we just talked about are, are, are going to come to their mind. A coming king that's going to bring deliverance like, uh, like Augustus Caesar is coming to bring deliverance for his people. So the terminology here that Mark uses, uh, what, what he's saying to us, he's saying through the usage of the word gospel, he's saying, I have got good news for you. And it's the kind of news that goes beyond any kind of good news or any kind of glad tidings that you have ever heard pronounced before. The, the announcement of Caesar Augustus coming to bring deliverance and salvation, it pales in comparison to what I am about to reveal to you. That's the idea that we see through Mark's usage of the word gospel. This is how a, a Gentile would have understood the word gospel, and, and, and a Jew, upon hearing that uh, word, w would have understood that, that this word means the, the coming of the Messiah King. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. That was prophesied all throughout the Old Testament to, to deliver God's people and, and establish a new eternal kingdom um, that would never end. Notice in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3, a prophecy of such Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they, may call, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So, whoever you are, Jew, Gentile, when you hear this word gospel, you know that something grand is here. A king has 
come. A king has come into the world. And, and, and that's what Mark wants us to see by this word. The, the good news of the arrival of someone great who will restore man's fellowship with, with the Almighty God that was once severed by sin uh, through, through his atoning substitutionary death. Not just for a certain group of people, not just for the Jews, not just for the Gentiles, not just for a certain nation or a certain group of people, but for the entire world. It says in Mark 16, 16, anyone and everyone who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That is the, uh, the good news that we see uh, within uh, the, the opening of Mark's account of uh, Jesus Christ, the good news of a king that's coming into the world, good news for Gentiles and good news for Jews as well. Now, another theme that we see uh, that, um, that helps us to understand the book as well, Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the good news of this man, Jesus. Mark declares the name of the king right here. Here he is. Here's the coming king. His name is Jesus. And his name is very fitting because the translation of his name reveals his mission into the world. And his mission by coming into the world. And in fact, the name it, Jesus, it, it comes from the Greek name uh, Jesus. Uh, and w which is a transliteration of, of the Hebrew name Yeshua, uh, which is uh, rendered Joshua in the Old Testament, meaning Yahweh saves, God saves. So, so his name, it reveals what he has come to earth to do. It reveals his mission, God saves. Remember how the angel instructed Joseph in, in Matthew chapter 1, Verse 21, it says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Likewise, in Acts chapter 4, verses 11 through 2, it says, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So Mark here wants us to understand that this coming king that he's about to proclaim is the one who will destroy our guilt, our shame that separates us from God and heal our sin sick souls, enabling us to love God, enabling us to love other people in, in, in a way that's perfect and, and complete. And we see this by His very name, Jesus. Yahweh saves. God saves. Likewise, another theme that we see in verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, many people have the idea that Jesus is his first name and then Christ is his last name. How, however, that, that isn't the case. Je Jesus is his name and Christ is his title. He is Jesus the Christ. Christ is a transliteration of the Greek word Christos, and, uh, which, which was used to translate the Hebrew term Messiah uh, or Mashiach. In, uh, in, in Hebrew, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. He is God's anointed one, God's chosen one, whom, whom the Jewish leaders mocked, and we'll see this as we go throughout the book, uh, be, because they were looking for this kind of Messiah, this kind of king who would deliver them from Roman oppression and, 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 and reestablish this independent Jewish state. Uh, notice, notice what Peter declared in, in the middle of the book, which, which, which serves as, as kind of the, a, a major turning point within the story. In Mark chapter 8, verse 27 through 29, it says, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, 
who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. So Mark wants his readers to understand that Jesus is the one that you've been waiting for. Jesus is the one that your soul longs for. He's the Lion of Judah. He's the Son of David. He's the shoot from the stump of Jesse. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the suffering servant that has come into the world to set things right. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah that your heart has been longing for. And that's what Mark wants you to see as you open the gospel account. And then lastly tonight, this last uh, theme that we see within verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus as the Son of God is one of the main themes that we see uh, within the book of Mark. Demons recognize Jesus as the Son of God. Notice in Mark chapter 3, verse 11, And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. At Jesus' transfiguration, God the Father himself declares Jesus as his Son, as the Son of God. In Mark chapter 9, verse 7, it says, And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. At Jesus' phony trial, we see his accusers label him as a blasphemer because he called himself the Son of God and the Son of Man. In Mark chapter 14, verse 61 through 62, it says, But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And a pagan A pagan Roman centurion was the one who finally, at the end of the account, recognized him as the Son of God when his own people rejected him. Mark chapter 15, verse 39, And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. The title, Son of God, could, uh, we could spend a lot of time on this, but basically it's signaling to us his, Jesus' incarnation and his divinity. The fact that he is Yahweh, that he is Jehovah God become human. God himself has come into our territory, has come into our space, and has become a servant, has become a mere slave For somebody like me, for somebody like you. And Mark, here, by proclaiming him as the Son of God, he wants you to realize the weight of what he's about to proclaim to you, what he's about to reveal, what he's about to tell you. The holy, sovereign God of the universe that has created everything that we see around us has come from heaven so that you might be healed. Oh, what a blessed thought. What a blessed thought that someone so high and mighty, someone so high above me and and so worthy would stoop down so low for me and for you and for the entire world. May his name be praised forevermore because Jesus is the Son of God of God. And Mark wants you to see that throughout his book. So the greatest story, the greatest story ever revealed to man is, is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. But, but, but it's much more than a story. It's much more than just a, 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 mere, a mere story uh, that, that, uh, that you would read in some kind of a, a secular story book. Um, it's alive. 
It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword that pierces into the heart of mankind, and it forces us to make a decision. It places us at a crossroads. Will we accept him? Will we accept this Christ and rest safe in his sheltering arms? That's a promise. That's a promise that he makes to you if you submit to him, if you choose him. Or will we deny him like so many have that we'll see throughout this gospel and so many have uh, throughout the centuries and so many consistently do within our world today and remain in our sinful condition? The choice is ours when we see this Jesus that we're about to talk about, that we're about to reveal within the gospel according to Mark. And if we choose to embrace him, we have, we now have the greatest hope and the greatest responsibility of spreading this gospel, of spreading this good news to all creation. Very excited about this study. I hope it all blesses us, and I hope all of us embrace this Jesus and this hope and this mission that he gives us together. Tonight, uh, if, you, if you have any need that we can uh, help you with, is there, if there's any way that we can minister to you, we invite you to come forward uh, tonight. So likewise, uh, if, if, you, if you realize that you're not a Christian, you can do so uh, by, uh, by simple faith in him, repentance and uh, and, and baptism into the name of Jesus Christ, beginning a relationship with Him. Tonight, if you have any need, why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing. <laughs>